Briska Formula One Stock Cars, the thunder and lightning division of UK Oval Racing. A Formula One stock car race is a mind-blowing affair. 20,000 horsepower, as many as 30 cars and 20 laps on a short oval track, either tarmac or loose surface, with the fastest starting at the back of the grid. The 37th season of Formula 1 stock car racing at Long Eaton Sports Stadium must have been one of the best ever. Right from the first meeting, the action was breathtaking. Take this incident at the season opener in March, featuring relative newcomer James Potter 164, challenging one of the sports greats, Peter Fulving in car number 33. It only took Potter three laps to return the compliment, in a manner of speaking. Nineteen ninety one continued in much the same way, with the drama coming thick and fast from March through to December.
The Norse premier venue, the Odsall Bowl near Bradford. Shale surfaced, 410 metres in length, steeply banked bends, unique solid steel fence. All these factors combine to create some of the fastest and most competitive racing in the country. But occasionally things do go wrong.
Bradford's main event of the 1991 season was the annual Trust Fund Classic, the only event of the year to feature just the top 20 red top drivers. The only exception to this rule was the defending champion, Rockwell Blue Top Danny Clark. This year's race was won by Frankie Wayman Jr., number 515, his first ever major title. down the home straight. It's got number 87 from Mark Webb Street, 226, 73. Rob Cowley, 123, down the far side. The 85 outfit of Ray Toosley. Then comes Dave Bersford in 260, Webb Street, 220, Junior Wayman. Then comes John Lund in 53 and 33. Peter Baldy on the inside of Paul Harris. Once again, Harrison is forced out wide. Almost clips the fence. Indeed, did clip the fence because you can see the barns in the shale that's been blacked up against the wall. Four casualties on the pit then turn, and there's going to be another one there because away goes Chandler in 2-1-3. Popped out of it nicely by 85. Ray Tilsley in 3. Beresford in 2-6-0. Junior Wayman in 5-1-5 and Lund in 53. 1-5 and Lund in 53. quite interesting a little further down because the pressures are on. Junior in fact giving uh, Beresford some hassle. It pushes uh, Beresford wide and that's enabled Junior Wayman to move into third place. Hey Caroline please. So we're at the halfway stage of this 20 lapper. 87 and a 73. Now, it certainly Cowley is getting closer, but so indeed is Junior Wayman in 5-1-5. And it looks as if this could be all set for a pretty close finish. And indeed, Cowley is going to be the first one. Or is he? No, he's not. He makes his challenge there. So does Junior Wayman in 5-1-5. And look at that. Seize the opportunity. Well, through came Junior Wayman. Up goes Neil Brigg in 87. 
Cowell is still in that second place in 73, and now it's the turn of John Lund to move up into third place in number 53. So it's five next time, Caroline, please. And it's Junior Wayman in 515 from Cowley in 73 and Lund in 53. Last lap now, Junior all set to take it by the look of it in 515. Checkered flag, and it's Junior's. Cowley, a very creditable Formula One racing by the seaside. That's what Skegness Stadium can offer you. This tight tarmac oval often favours the underdog, with many top drivers falling by the wayside. The feature event of 1991 in Skegness was the first of the World Championship semi-finals, one of the most dramatic races for years, with Kev Smith in car number 64 putting out five other top drivers in one lap and winning many fans in the process. He may not have won eventually, but he did make the race famous. The victory went to defending world champion Bert Finnekin. cars are told to go rolling they're under starters orders for the Skegness semi-final last roars of encouragement from the terraces to their favorites as they come under starters orders they've got the green and the race is on and the battle for the first turn develops with John Lundlini hard on Nigel Wharton and uh, they're in the fence there's an almighty shunt on that time, Ben Beresford, London, Wharton have gone. And it's Bert Finnegan who leads, but Kev Smith's put Finnegan out, and Kev Smith goes to the front. So it's 64, Kev Smith the leader at the end of the first lap from 162, Richard Pratt and 471, Bobby Burns, 86, David Torson is fourth. John Lorne and Dave uh, Beresford are out down there on the town bend. So they've sorted themselves out from that initial panic on the start and it's Kev Smith the leader. Off the town bend he goes onto the back straight in number 64. In second place it's 86 David Tolson, 55 Bert Finnegan is third, Bobby Burns is fourth in 471. And Finnegan has just relegated Tolson down a place. And John Lund didn't work that time trying to get past Kev Smith. Kev Smith leads the race in 64. What? And Kev Smith leads them through again in the 64 car where he's under pressure now from 55, Bert Finnegan. Shane Dole and Mark Webster have gone to the fence at the end of the home straight. And 98, Les Spencer has gone to the infield where Ray Williams is also out of the race. So changes amongst those top places and Chris Arwell's gone. Kev Smith has done the deal on Chris Arwell, a deal on Chris Arwell, and Arwell's in the fence on the town bend in 5.01. And this is the halfway stage. 12 laps gone, 13 to go, and it's 55. Bert Finnegan, the leader from 86, David Tolson. 
So now Jane Bean putting some pressure on Kev Smith and Jane Bean goes past Kev Smith and he hits Jane Bean hard down into that pit turn. A tremendous tussle for those two. They're battling over fourth place. And now Dan Clark gets involved and what a battle that is for fourth place. Off the town bend and down the back straight and Jane Bean's got a problem. And it's five to run next time. So we go towards the closing stages. Bean in trouble on the pit turn there in a battle with Kev Smith. It gets uh, dropped another one. He's going backwards and he's in danger of being lapped now by the leader, Bert Finnegan. Finnegan still leads. Torson getting a bit closer to him in these closing stages. Here with the last lap in the Skegness semi. And it's Finnegan the leader. 55. Torson second in 86 and Torson's gone. Torson's lost it in a tangle with uh, Mike James. So uh, Bert Finnegan is going to come through and win it. 55, Bert Finnegan wins it. And the second man home is going to be Bobby Burns. In third, it's Dan Clark. Fourth is Des Chandler. Fifth, Richard Pratt. Sixth, Jane Beam. Seven, John. Stay away and it really is a case of only the toughest will survive. In the last year, a change of promoter has led to the creation of a super smooth racing surface, which really allows the cars to achieve some frightening speeds.
Crewe staged the second of the 1991 World Championship semi-finals, and although the top three to finish were no surprise, further down the field many top runners went out, leaving the way clear for some lesser names to make the World Final. A major surprise exit from the race was that of Frankie Wayman Jr. in car 515 when he was lying second to eventual winner Peter Falding in car number 33. Facing in the Formula One semi final, 33 Peter Falding makes the drop and leads him away from 515 Frankie Wayman Jr. and number two Paul Harrison. All the front of the grid are away into the first circuit, 272. Andy Hodgson has lost his place slightly around that first turn. And 486 Jeff Alderson's got a little bit of drift as well. And the first one to come to grief is John Padgett in car number 449. Frankie Wayman Jr. in 515. Paul Harrison in number 2. Ian Platts in 77. Andy Hudson in 272. Ray Tilsley in 85. Richard Mason in 202 with Gaz Bott in 41. 33 and 515. Problems for Frankie Wayman in 212. 33 gets through. 515 gets held up. Number 2, Paul Harrison gets through. Does he? No, he doesn't. 515 and 272 get away. 87 escapes, number two gets his, finally manages to fight his way out, but that has left 33 feet of falling away by a street. Padgett is onto the infield and will go no further in this semi-final. 33, Peter Falding has it. Frankie Wayman Jr. is second in 515, he goes through. Then it's a little bit difficult to see who he's gone in with. Warren Hunter has lost his way up there as well in number 20. Halfway next time, Mr. Starter, halfway. And 33, Peter Folding. 515 is second. 33, 515. Still moving closer. I think that's my... 33 and 515 are still the one, two. Fourth and Paul Harrison in number two. Fifth is Ray Tilsley, 85. And Frankie Wayman Jr. has gone in on that top turn and he's got problems up there. And that has allowed 33 to get right away. Looks like the 515 car won't be going any further. 272, Andy Hodgson will go second. Paul Harrison up to third in number two and Ray Tilsley fourth in car number 85. Frankie Wayman Jr. abandons his car in mid-circuit on that top turn, leaps the safety fence, and won't make the final at the first time of asking. Next time, Mr. Starter, five, and Peter Falling looks to have this one in the bag. It's still running, and they're all going to make it bar one. We're going to need to keep them going at the end of this, Mr. Starter, for quite a while. Here he comes round the final turn, down the home straight to win the semi-final. Peter Falling in car number 33 wins it. By a huge distance. Scunthorpe is a shale raceway with a difference. It is perhaps the only track in the country where every driver on the grid is considered to be in with a chance of victory. Promoter at the Eastern track is former six times world champion Stu Smith, but even he might have found it difficult to coast to an easy win around the narrow oval. As you will see, present world champion John Lund, 53, finds it a trial to get around Scunthorpe unscathed.
Highlight of the year at Scunthorpe, World Championship Consolation Semi-Final, a nightmare for the lap scorers, many major incidents, most involving the fancy runners. That's the green, they've got to go. the pit turn they go a lot of traffic there someone's sideways on down the back straight it's mike hayward 424 mike ives has turned to face the oncoming traffic and derek fairhurst has gone out down there seven and phil wilton in the lease phil wilton's gone second now in number six as they come back to the home straight and who still has the lead down the back straight in amongst the back markers now phil wilton running second in number six as they go down to that turnstile bend again now brown or at least it was last time round and here he comes again on the home straight. 34, Mal Brown, the leader. Phil Wilton second in number six, but coming under pressure now from, uh, I beg your pardon, Warren Hunter second, and Phil Wilton third, and Junior Wayman fourth. Gone at Hensford, and still Mal Brown, the yellow top, leads them through in 34. The Waymans pacing themselves through the field. Junior Wayman leading Senior Wayman, and up the paces they go. Wilton five, Dave Perisford through the top, leads them Mal Brown. He's broken away from the field. And now uh, Junior Wayman making his presence felt. He's coming through hard. He's left Frankie Senior behind. Mel Brown is through again down the home straight, and that's the halfway. Dave Beresford losing ground on the turnstile bend. Junior Wayman has gone second. Warren Hunter third. And we'll check them through this time round. 34, Mel Brown the leader. Just gone missing up on that pit turn. And the leader's gone. Mel Brown's in trouble on that pit turn, and Junior Wayman's gone as well. And Frankie Wayman coming through on the infield, and it's uh, Frankie Wayman, the leader in 2 1 2, and Mel Brown 34. And Phil Wilton's gone third, and uh, Junior Wayman fourth, now regaining third. He's in trouble again on that pit turn. And it's Dave Beresford who's gone third. And Mel Brown, who's put up such a fight, he's still fighting to hold on to the lead, but Frankie Wayman's took him with five to run. Junior Wayman's gone to the fence on the back straight. And that was a big shunt down the back straight. Junior Wayman still moving, and uh, so I think is Gareth Potter was involved. Another of the hard luck stories on the road to the Gold Road for Hensford. But it's Frankie Wayman, the leader. 2-1-2 from Dave Beresford, 2-6-0. Through the 23-car carnage, two-star men look like making it to Hensford. Fifth place, Glyn Daft has gone to the fence on the pit turn. And into the home straight they come, heading for Hensford in the world final. It's Frankie Wayman, the winner in 2-1-2. Dave Beresford takes second place in 2 6 -0. Hensford Raceway is where stock cars really come to life. Contact at speeds approaching 100 miles per hour, a sight not to be missed. If you get it wrong on this tarmac oval, then you really are in trouble.
The highlight of the whole stock car season took place at Hensford during 1991, the Championship of the World Race. Drama with a false start and then action from the very first turn entertained the 12,000 strong crowd and then a sensational last bend finish allowed John Lunds through to win the title for the third time. No wonder he regards Hensford as his favourite track. Got the green and the world final is underway. And off they go towards that first turn with Peter Folding trying to escape the bumpers from the back. And Andy Hodgson makes a dive through on the inside in 272, followed by Ron Clunder, Bobby Burns and Bert Finnegan. Bumpers are flying up on that east bend. And it's Finnegan on the inside who scraped through. And Martin Verhoff's in trouble with Paul House and he's tangled down and Dan Clark and uh, Verhoff and Clark are the first to go. On the back straight, Neil Brigg and Barry Pedrescu in a heap, but Ron Clunder has gone to the wall on the west bend. And the leader is the defending champion, Bert Finnegan, followed by Peter Folding and Andy Hodgson. And uh, things just a bit hairy out there in the opening stages. Matty Petrovsky's out of his tribe. A long way to come from New Zealand again in the early stages. Martin Verhoof's gone. 64, Kev Smith was parked up down on the home straight. Dan Clark and Frankie Wayman out. Neil Brigg out. Arrow aside. He now tries to lap uh, Jeff Nichols down the back straight in 215. And he goes by him. And Finnegan is the leader still, and he's under pressure. And we've now lost 77, Chris Pinnell at the end of the home straight. Behind him is Ray Tilsley, fifth. And then Ron Cruder is third of six. John Lund has gone third. He's dropped Andy Hodgson a place. Hodgson fighting back, gets in behind Lund up on that. He's been the bumpers going and Lund has almost gone. And Hodgson gets along the inside of him, but Lund rides it. And in a road day as well, Chief 31. But into the second half we've gone and the leader is 55, Bert Finnegan. He's coming through on the home straight with Peter Folding second in 33 and John Lund third in 53. Last time, Finnegan draws away from Folding. They're down to the east bend and Folding comes in with the big one. Onto that last bend they go. And Finnegan has gone and takes Folding away. And John Lund has won the world title. And Finnegan comes over the line, followed by Chandler. And Peter Folding has not completed the distance. And Pete Kites are over the line and Ray Tilsley and Jane Bean. And then Paul Harrison and Dave Ferrisford and saw that one out as they come over the line. Reds, please, Mr. Starter. British Drivers' Championship was the scenic Peak District track known as Buxton. New high edge raceway is a quick but narrow tarmac oval, not allowing much scope for error. The man who got it all right on the big day was Paul Harrison, number two.
Barlow in Holland, venue for the annual Long Track World Championship. The popularity of this event with English fans is enormous, with hundreds travelling across the North Sea to support the British drivers in the event. Most of the Dutch entrants in the Hensford World Final race regularly here, and that experience told with the English drivers failing to win the title in 1991. Defending champion Englishman John Lund had to test for second behind Ron Kroonde in car number 217. The UK's other main hope and twice winner of the title, Rotherham's Peter Falding, blew his engine as he began his charge to the front, the second time in two weeks that he considered himself robbed of a world title. Boston, a shale track that really has shaken the stock car scene since its introduction to the fixture list in 1989, gaining a reputation for on-the-limit racing that is tremendously popular with the fans. The main event at Boston was the Grand Prix finale in which the favourite, John Lund, was denied a chance to take the title by a spinning bat marker, leaving Frankie Wayman Jr. home and dry, the Grand Prix providing him with his third title win of the season.